Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to talk about a little bit of psychology today. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, my name is Amin, and I'm uh, from Vancouver, Canada. I am the founder of AY Technologies, uh, which is a uh, software development agency. And what we do, get my mouse right here, perfect. So we do help tech startups and software companies with their software development planning a lot. And we have a process uh, for that called the Roadmap Workshop. Um, the, the workshop was ba basically put together by, by the experiences that my team and I had throughout the years uh, developing and architecting software systems, uh, as well as it's highly influenced by psychology, which is something that I'm going to talk about today with you guys. Over the years, what we've seen is that the focus on speed is causing issues. What, what, what we've seen is that as you focus on the speed and it becomes the main KPI, um, KPI of uh, progress in software development or delivery, you lose focus on quality. And because of that, uh, you're going to have issues with uh, uh, the low quality is going to have issues with project failure. And although from the company's perspective, developing software faster and delivering faster is good because you're going to have a lower cost, uh, the project failure we're going to have loss for the companies. Uh, so the question that we, we were trying to uh, answer or we, we were thinking about is that, why do we make more mistakes when things are moving faster? What is it about fastness, the speed of things that is causing these issues for us. Because if you think about it, if the things were slower, you would not make the mistake, which means that your brain knows the right answer, but somehow you're getting yourself in a situation that, uh, although it knows the right answer, it's giving you the wrong answer to work with. So that will be something that we're going to talk about. Around the same time that I had that question, I got introduced to the book Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. And in the book, Daniel Kahneman talks about, um, describes how our brain works and how the different parts of our brains uh, behave differently and the, how, uh, and the effect of that on the decision making um, and how, uh, how, we, how we make those decisions. Also, he talks about many cognitive biases that we have and how that affects uh, the way that we see the world and we make decisions. So it, this is an example of it. So we'll show off who have seen this before. Perfect. I was expecting all of you guys have seen this and know that the two lines are the same length. Yet every time I look at these, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be the same for you guys, my eyes are telling me that the line in the bottom is shorter. The, the only reason that you're saying that the two lines are the same is because you have seen this before and you realize that it is actually an optical illusion. So the eye is saying that the, the line on the bottom is shorter, but your brain is overriding that decision by knowing the bias that you have toward this. So. Basically, that is the goal of the, the talk today. To, uh, I want to introduce a couple of the uh, uh, cognitive biases that we have when it comes to estimating software projects. And hopefully, by the end of the talk, I can introduce you to a couple of ways that we can um, identify those biases and hopefully make it better as we go. So, so far, I talked about Daniel Kahneman. I mentioned his name a couple of times. Let me introduce him to you guys. Daniel Kahneman is a psychologist known for his work on psychology of judgment and decision making. He's considered the founder of behavior economics and based on his work on prospect theory with Amos Tversky. And he's the only Nobel Prize winner of economics who is a psychologist. So he's a big shot in psychology. And I'm using a lot of uh, examples from his books and all the ideas about this talk are basically based on his work. In 1979, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, they coined the term planning fallacy uh, to describe plans and forecasts that are unrealistically close to the best case scenario. 
So the best case scenario was the term that caught my eye, and I know that many of you can relate to that. That project that was supposed to be straightforward, but something unexpected happened, and it took way more time than it, that it was supposed to take. That is the case that is happening almost every day in a lot of software projects. And the reason for, for them happening is the, the, the topic that we want to talk about. But basically, what's happening is that that problem is occurring over and over again. It looks like we're not learning from the mistakes that are happening. And Kahneman and Tversky noticed that too as they added to the definition of planning soft, uh, fallacy that these plans can be improved by consulting the statistics of uh, the, the similar cases. So we are making the same mistakes over and over again. Why are we doing that? What, what are the things that we are not paying attention to? In order to start talking a little bit about that, actually, let me just go through a couple of examples of planning fallacy first, uh, so you can see the extent of the, the, the issue. Scottish Parliament building is, an, is a fascinati fascinating case in that. Uh, in 1997, the new Scottish Parliament building project was estimated to cost 40 million pounds. By June 1999, 109 million pounds in about two years. In April 2000, the legislators requested a cap on the cost, and the cost was released to 195 million pounds. In November 2001, they demanded a final cost, and it was set to 241 million pounds. In 2002, the estimates rose twice, ending the year at 295 million pounds and three times more in 2003. So now we are at 375 million pounds. And the project was finally done in 2004, the total cost of 431 million pounds. That's more than 10 times the initial estimate. And if you think that it's always government and that have these issues, you're wrong. This happens in, uh, in all the other industries as well. Here's an example. In 2002, a survey of American homeowners showed that the people who were remodeling their kitchens were expecting the cost to be between 18 and $19,000, where in fact, the average estimate was more than $38,000. So twice as more on something that is small relatively. And if you think that software is better, well, <laughs> you're wrong. There, there's actually a page in Wikipedia called the list of failed and over budget custom software projects. You can just go and look, look that up. And, and another example of that that's uh, very recent is the healthcare.gov project. The estimate for that project was $95 million. The actual was $1.5 billion, more than 15 times more. But this is the thing. Like I know some people from healthcare.gov project and I know myself, I consider myself a competent person. How do we competent people make these big mistakes? What's happening that's causing this type of issues? Well, in order to understand that, we have to talk a little bit about our brains and how it works. Because that was gonna give us a way to understand how the problems, how the mistakes are happening. So we need to know that in our brains, there are two systems working simultaneously. Psychologists give them many different names. I like a more non-descriptive names of system one and system two. And I want to describe those two systems to you guys today. Um, basically, the system one is the system that is fast and, and creates intuitive reactions and instantaneous decisions, and it governs most of our lives is the automatic system that's at work all the time. System two is the system involved with deliberation and the, the, the deliberate type of thinking involved in focus, reasoning, analysis, anything like calculating a complex math is your system two that is gonna do that. 
and basically it's uh, we usually identify ourselves with our system too, although many of daily actions every day are like most of it is done by the system one, the, the automatic system. But if you want to just compare the two systems, system one is automatic and quick. System two is lazy and slow. System one takes or little or no effort to work. System two takes energy and mental focus to work. System one is on all the time and you cannot turn it off. System two is by default off and it only wakes up when when you really need it, and then it goes back. So <coughs> knowing these two systems, the next step is to understand a couple of cognitive biases that having these two systems, th these two completely different systems, create when we are making any decisions. So, uh, and today I'm going to go over um, three different factors, and then hopefully by the end of the, day, uh, the, the talk I can show you how that affects our estimates in software development. But let's go back to our optical illusion. What's happening here is that your system one is seeing this image, this photo, and immediately deciding that the, the line in the bottom is shorter. That's, and, and one interesting thing about this image is that any time that you look at it, just close your eyes and look at it again, you're going to make the same decision. You're going to make the same judgment about the lines. It's like the phenomenon that if you read a word written somewhere, you're going to read it. You can't stop that from happening because system one is not voluntary. It's happening all the time. But then, because you know the right answer here and you know that you're about to make a mistake, your system two wakes up and overrides the decision of the system one, saying that two lines are the same length. That's basically what's happening. Your two systems are happening, working alongside each other, and system two is preventing you from making a mistake. Again, if you like to learn more about the two systems, I highly recommend reading uh, Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, and actually there's another book about him released this year called The Undoing Project. They're great reads. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the forces that are in, in works when we are making estimations and the type of cognitive biases that we have in our brain. The first one is what you see is all there is. So basically, what it means is that the information that you have available and the information that you don't have, they get treated completely differently when your brain is making a decision about something. So basically, the, it's an essential design feature of our associative machine, which is our brain, that it only represents the activated ideas. So the information that it does not retrieve, even uh, unconsciously, may it as well not be there. So this, is, this means that your system one is seeking, the, it's measuring the truth of some facts or truths of things that you're, you're seeing based on how coherent story is going to be around that. So an example of that. Will Mindy be a good leader? She's intelligent and smart. What's the first thought that comes to mind? Yes. Why yes? Because the story is coherent. If Mindy is intelligent and smart, so per probably she's going to be a good leader. Everything in this sentence is positive. So the answer is yes. Now, if I just change the adjectives there to corrupt and cruel, your decision is changing immediately to no. And like we are jumping to conclusion very fast. We are not, tr we, our system two is not up yet. It's basically system one making that decision. So that's the coherent story that's creating um, the result for us. And basically what, what you see is all there is, is the result of a coherent seeking system one and a lazy system two that is not up to override that decision. The second force that I want to talk about is called prediction by associations or I call it the curious case of Tom W. 
So consider that there is Tom W. just enrolled in the University of Michigan, and you know that University of well, Michigan State University takes 1,000 graduate students each year, and the the, uh, the percentage of a student that goes into each of those majors are based on the numbers there. So business management and marketing, 28%. Communication and journalism, 23 all the way to computer science being 5%. Now, if I ask you, what's the likelihood of Tom W. being enrolled in any of these cases? And like on a scale of 1 to 6, 1 being the most likely and 6 being the least likely, the answer comes easily to mind. You're going to look at the numbers and say, the chance of him being in business is more than computer science. Because it's 28% of people go to uh, business, and only 5% goes to com computer science. Now let me add one more piece of information here. Um, actually, let's go back. So the reason that you're making that decision is that you don't have any other piece of data or information to use to go against your base rate. So the base rate is there. That's the only information that you have, and you're going to use it. But let me add one piece of uh, information. So the following is a personality sketch of Tom W. written during Tom's senior year in high school by a psychologist on the basis of psychological tests on uncertain validity. Tom W. is of high intelligence, although lacking in true creativity. He has a need for order and clarity, and for neat and tidy system in which every detail finds its appropriate place. His writing is rather dull and mechanical, occasionally enlivened by somewhat corny puns and flashes of imagination of the sci-fi sci type. He has a strong drive for competence, he seemed to have little feel and little sympathy for other people and does not enjoy interacting with others. Self-centered, he nonetheless has a deep moral sense. So I'm going to ask the same question again from you guys. What is the likelihood of Tom W. being enrolled in those six fields uh, from one to six, one being the most likely? Uh, so by the show of hands, who thinks he's in computer science? What about engineering? What about social sciences? No one. What about business? So this is what happened. You're, you were given a piece of information that up there I said that the validity of that is uncertain. Yet, you're using that information and it changes the way that you look at the base rate which is still the correct answer here, right? So still, with that, that information is not helping put Tom W in business or computer science. Well, what's happening is that our system one is now activated. Although the task that I ask you to do, ranking those things, is complicated, and only system two is capable of that. The system one, the, the, uh, the pieces of information that we put in that description are there to activate your system one to wake up and use oops, use a stereotypes and like okay sorry about that and, and use a stereotypes and basically overrides it, it's giving system two something to work with that he didn't have before basically your system two is so lazy that it doesn't want to put the effort into understanding that the data statement is irrelevant. Instead, it's asking system one, What's, what do you think about this? And your system one is kind of dumb for that question. So instead of answering the question, what is the likelihood of Tom W being enrolled in each of those cases, it's swapping the question with that, the fact that that description, is that coherent with Tom W. being in computer science or in social sciences. And because it's the, the, the description is more coherent with him being a, in engineering or computer science, it's overriding the decision that was supposed to be the 28% has a higher chance of being Tom W. in the business. 
So that, that's what happened. That's the second force. The third force is uh, anchoring. So the question is, what's the percentage of African nations in the United Nations? Uh, and it's not, an, uh, it's not something that everybody knows by heart. Um, but do you think that has anything to do with a bill of fortune? Probably not. But you will be wrong with that. So in uh, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, they ran a study in uh, University of Oregon in which they asked graduate students to turn a wheel of fortune that they rigged to only stop at 10 or 65. And then they asked them this question. So the result was that the people who saw 10 on the wheel of fortune, their average guess was 25%. And the people who saw 65 on the wheel of fortune, their average guess was 45%. So what's happening here is that anchoring is causing those people. So those people are faced with a question that they don't know the answer, the correct answer to. And when, when our brain is trying to answer a question and is just guessing, it's looking everywhere to find clue. And although I'm pretty sure all those graduate students knew that, that the number that they saw on the Wheel of Fortune has nothing to do with uh, the number of the percentage of uh, African nations in the United Nations, that number was available. So their mind basically use that number, and although they know, for example, that 10 is low of a number, they adjusted that 10, and they only went so far to 25%. And, I, and th they did the same thing for 65, they came down from 65 to 45%. What that means is that what you see gonna have effect on what your brain gonna come up with, even if those, those things are not related to each other. So these are the three fa forces that uh, I, I wanted to tell you guys. But now, uh, how can we, what's the effect of these things in our estimation, in, our, in software development, and how can we stop that from happening? So let's start with uh, what you see is all there is. So basically what that means is that when you're estimating a project or a user story, when you have less details, you're going to have higher chance of um, having a less accurate estimate. And we all know that, but this is why it's happening. So when you hear something like, that will slow us down, we don't have time to create that details. Or just give me a ballpark estimate. I don't, I don't ha it doesn't have to be very accurate, just give me a ballpark estimate. Or if you hear anything like, I can't wait until we have all the details. These are clues that what you see, is all there is gonna happen, and your estimate gonna be wrong. So what can we do to make that better is that we need to have more detailed user stories or uh, a specific project descriptions. Definition of done is one way that that can be easily uh, achieved because you can write one definition of done and you can use that for all the different tasks and it will remind your brain that there are these different things that I have to think about before I can estimate this task or this project. So that is one of the reasons of the value of uh, definition of done. So this is basically the goal is not, I'm not going to tell you a lot of new things that you didn't know. I just want to tell you why they are important. The, another thing that is important, the acceptance criteria. Why? Because usually it has, uh, because usually it has all the details of like the corner cases that your brain will not think about them. And when, when that happens, like if you don't um, think about the QA, then you're not gonna estimate for that. And then the project gonna start, and then you're gonna spend some time on QA and bug fixing, and then you're gonna be behind the schedule. Another thing is that if anybody asks you to give them a ballpark estimate, give them a range. Create a range for yourself that you can actually be more um, accurate in that. Like, at, at least you have some, some room uh, for, for wiggling. Uh, the, this, the second force that we talked about was the 
the prediction by association. And that's a little bit harder to notice when that's happening. But basically, the, the reason that is an issue is that we don't consider the cases, the, the data that we have about our, our estimations. So basically, to, it's harder to notice, but it, when you're estimating multiple tasks in a row or you're looking, you're estimating without looking into the data, that means that it's probably going to happen. The, the way that you can offset that is look at the data that you have on similar projects. This is the way that we do it. We collect not only the estimates at the start of each sprint, but we also collect actuals at the end of each sprint. So we know that that task that was supposed to take two story points, it was 20% over, uh, take 20% more time than, than we estimated. And we don't use that to blame people not doing the good work, but what that gave us is that the, we, we now have a big database of uh, all the different types of tasks and how much on average they're taking less or more time than the estimation. Using that database, now I can tell you that if there's a story uh, pointed three story points and it's on front end, on React Native, we're probably going to take 30% more time than uh, the estimation. And then we can use that data to offset our estimations to make them more, more uh, accurate. And you can compare the actuals on similar projects or similar tasks. And the third one uh, was the, uh, the anchoring. This is basically what you will hear. When you, when you hear something like that, I think we should be able to do this in a month. What do you think? You're anchoring someone. If you say that you're anchoring someone, if you hear that somebody's anchoring you, what, what that causes is that if there was a project that I think, if you haven't put one month out there, I would have thought it would take five months. When you say one month, I'm going to bring that down to, oh, maybe I can do that in two or three months. And then basically we're going to get into a situation that a, pro a project was promised to take only three months, and it's taking five months, and we are behind the schedule, we are over budget, we are over time. So hearing anything like this or... Do you agree that we can do this in one sprint? All these are anchoring, and it's good to know them and be able to um, compensate for that. Planning poker is a great tool to use when it comes to anchoring, but I would go even one step further and s start estimating separately before the meeting, because even the first thing that you would uh, estimate the size is going to have anchoring effect on the second thing that you uh, estimate. You can even go one step further and randomize the, uh, the user stories that you're estimating because if you estimate all those small user stories first, they're going to have anchoring effect on the, on the bigger user stories that you're going to estimate later or vice versa. So with that, uh, I'm going to conclude my uh, conversation. The whole thing is about knowing your cognitive biases. And cognitive biases, you cannot remove it from the way that you're thinking. But when you know it and when you can identify it, basically you can start compensating for the fact that that is happening, that issue is happening in your mind. Uh, identify them when they occur, adjust estimates accordingly, and use as much data as you can. The data is the best thing that we have. We need to use it. We can deal with data. We can use it. So let's, let's, let's do more of that. And no project is completely unique. You can, ha you can find data on a related projects or related tasks, so use that data. And with that, uh, I will leave it to you guys. If you have any questions, uh, my contact information is up there.